Good morning, everyone. My name is Michaela Smalley here with the Basketball Embassy International Coaches Summit. I hope you're having a great morning. We have a fantastic speaker this morning. He is the head coach of the Seattle Storm WNBA team. His name is Dan Hughes, and he will be speaking to us today about winning the day. If you have any questions for him as he goes along, please leave them in the Q&A and we will ask him in the end. So without further ado, Coach Hughes, take it away. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know what your expectations of the next hour are, but let's just get on the record. I want to far exceed. I want to make sure that we can uh, have a dialogue wherever you may be about coaching. And to begin with the point, let me tell you a little bit about where I arrived to kind of where I am right now. Um, I've coached almost 42 years. I've coached about half of it with men, and I worked from high school to small college to Division I. Uh, I went into women's basketball. Um, it's been fantastic for me, and I have spent over 20 years in various positions throughout the WNBA. Um, I have probably uh, coached at about every level that, that you can imagine. Uh, and so that all kind of, that journey kind of landed me uh, where I have mostly been over the last two decades and that's in the WNBA. And uh, what I would like to do is first of all, kind of talk a little bit about the basketball embassy. Um, I spent uh, 12, over 12 years in San Antonio uh, and it was so productive from a basketball standpoint, not only from learning, um, and being in a great environment in San Antonio, but also um, getting acquainted with the basketball embassy that Chris Dial has created. I, I, I love the outreach where we're taking the sport of basketball and we're reaching out to the world and we're trying to unite. You know, this is a time period where communication is really important and doing things that sometimes uh, are unseen. You know, I have to speak to my team today on a Zoom call. And one of the things I'm gonna to talk to them about is doing things when nobody's watching. You think nobody's watching, but in reality, you're communicating, you're making yourself, your team, your situation better. And the basketball embassy to me has so many proponents that you know, you take the sport of basketball, you take coaching, and now you try to unite people across the world. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be involved with USA Basketball and have traveled the world and, and have seen basketball. And even during this period that we've been in isolation, um, really have reached a kind of communication with people throughout our world. Uh, I've talked in Brazil, I've talked in Australia, um, I, I, I've talked in Serbia, um, and, and, I, and I love that. I, I, I think that but the basketball embassy, and if you have the ability to donate or support, um, you're, you're, you're donating to a nonprofit that really does some great, great things. But my topic today is winning the day-to-day, -day. and we, we need a starting point. Uh, like this. But before I get into it, I'm going to talk for about half of my time. And really what I'd like to do is spend the second half of my time just in dialogue about questions you might have, about things you'd like me to elaborate on. And they don't have to do anything with what I'm talking about. You know, it could be from how do you defend, what, how many schemes do you use to defend the pick and roll to how do you handle parents to, uh, I got a tough administrator who puts pressure on me, all those kind of things. And I have several questions that have been sent to me, but I would love to have live questions. So if you would kind of correspond, um, they'll get to me, hopefully, and we can have a little dialogue because uh, the one thing about being an older coach is that I, I have seen a lot. And uh, there's not a lot of things that are great about it, but that one I have. And hopefully that's where we'll go. 
But let's jump into winning the day-to-day. The, the reason I titled that, it's something I talk about a lot. Um, I'm in a situation in WNBA, anytime you're, and, and most of us are in that, where, you know, you're, you're doing it to win a championship. And, and I, it's no different. I mean, that's going to be the expectation I had last year, the year before, and this year. And probably for the rest of the time I coach in Seattle, that's always going to be the expectation. And I, I, I think it's important that we kind of understand what we do on a day-to-day basis, to me, messages more than me shouting out some goal that we're going to win a championship. I mean, to me, I want to message winning the day-to-day. I want to do things day-to-day that lead to effective basketball, that lead to all the things that I think excellence and excellence in our world is always, well, here, here, here's the champion, you know. But I don't think just talking about it is a way that you arrive there. I think you arrive there by what you do on a daily basis. So when you win the day-to-day, then I think the journey now takes you to a chance, possibly, if you win enough of those day-to-days, a chance for a championship, all right? And then you have that day that you have that opportunity. And, and it's business as usual, because you won all those days. And that's it's a little different how, how I approach that, but that's kind of how I look and certainly handle expectations of championships in regard to it. I'm gonna give three things I'm gonna talk about in winning the day-to-day that I think encompass and give me a chance to relate to a couple of things at that point. And I'm gonna give them to you up front. You know, one is a culture of excellence. And I'll, I'll speak to five points in that. And secondly, practice and game planning. And I'll speak to five points there. And then lastly, coaching communication that leads to empowering your team. And I'll try to touch five things there. And so let's jump into the first, the culture of excellence, because to me, There is nothing more about winning the day-to-day than establishing a healthy culture and a culture that has a a direct look at excellence and and how you kind of attain that on a day-to-day thing. And and I think, you know, it all begins as we put our rosters together with something I I constantly talk about, and that's building a team with teammates. I have a very hard time Uh, looking at somebody on my team as a pivotal player, as somebody that's going to do that and not also see them as a good teammate. I'm just going to tell you up front, I have certainly had to make decisions and there's times I've, I've been in as a high school head coach. I've been all those things where sometimes you inherit kids and you have to work to get them to be good teammates. But that beginning point is essential to me. You know, uh, we just went through a draft. We, for a lot of years, I was a GM. I I did a lot of things, but I had to answer two questions as my roster filled out. One is what can they do that has a WNBA skill, a WNBA talent, you know, in your situation, just substitute the level you're at. And the second question was they had to be a good teammate. And if I couldn't answer both of those, I just couldn't get behind it, you know, because to me, the energy that, that you create for your team, all right, by good teammates, you know, for everyone that takes of that energy, and we all know what, what we're talking about there, it not only affects you as a coach, it affects your leaders on that team, even more so your leaders on that team, because it, they, they end up eating up all their time and all their efforts and all their energy. So I need people who give energy and I need good teammates. And that certainly is a beginning point for me in a culture of excellence. The second thing is you've got to build relationships, no matter how you slice it. We coach players that we absolutely love and that's easy to build relationships. You know, let's be factual. We coach some players that, that, that we don't love easily. That I, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but sometimes it is. And we have to build relationships with those players too. And I think it's important because in a lot of ways you can really change um, the relationship 
and direction of a, of a talent and a player who you believe in by building relationships with. And, and I think it, 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 sometimes it is about your ability to, on a daily basis, somehow physically, uh, verbally, but somehow relate to that player. It doesn't always have to be about talking. And you're going to hear that as I, as I go here. There, there's ways, you know, when you do things in practice, when you design certain things, when you are running a drill, there are ways you can build relationships uh, with players. But I think that's the second point that I want to make about excellence. I think the building of relationships is part of it. And I will tell you this, I, I, I'm in my 42nd or 43rd year of coaching. And those are the things that are most reflective when I intersect with players I, I, I have coached and my, my memory, my memory, and, and, and I've been blessed to be involved with championships and all those things, but I don't really go to that as quickly as I go to the relationship, that person, you know, that you dealt with and are dealing with. The third thing is you got to embrace the grind. Let, let me tell you up front that anything that's, that, that, that comes easy is not realistic to our world. And you will deal with people who think it's easy. And I would socially distance yourself from those people if they think it's easy, because it's not. It's going to be, you have to embrace the grind. You have to do a good job of, you got to put one foot in front of the other, you know, in a pursuit of excellence. You know, some days it's very rewarding. Some days it's very tough. But you, you and you need people around you that embrace that grind, that they know that grind is really preparing you for what you're trying to do. I, I, I will give you one quick story. We won a championship in 218. And I remember we had won, uh, we're in the semifinals. We, we play Phoenix, um, win two games lose two games. Now we're in game five, which is a deciding game in the WNBA. Um, and I remember, you know, we were shooting around and I go, I need to say something today that ties this experience we're into together. And I said, you know, for us to be champions, I think we had to have this moment where the journey had taught us things along the way. Now we put them to use and now we, we display that we are championship caliber when you're into a, a one game, win in advance or go home. And, I, you know, I, I think that game turned out to be a good one for Seattle. We came back in second half one and then went into the finals and, and, and won three. But I think it was because we had embraced the grind of that journey to get there. And when the moment came, we, we kind of understood we're prepared. And I think that's really important. Fourth thing is actions are, are, are greater than words. I talk less as a 65 year old coach than I did when I was a 50 year old coach or 40 year old coach. I talk less. I, 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 what I do is interpreted way more powerfully. And I will say in a culture of excellence that, that actions are outcomes. Actions have outcomes. And my actions have outcomes. And I can talk to them blue in the face, but my action will probably create an outcome that will message to my players far more than anything I, I may say. Okay. And the last thing I'll, I'll say to you about a culture of excellence, and I, and I got this you know, uh, along the way. And I certainly got into San Antonio kind of watching the Spurs. The Spurs at that point were an amazing NBA team. And I was in a situation where I worked for Peter Holt and the ownership group that owned the, the Spurs. And I was around them. But I always, when I was around them, I always gleaned that they were always looking for a better way. And yet they were champions. They were the model but always looking for a better way. And that has really stuck with me. And no matter as you advance in age as a coach, keep looking for a better way and be open to it. It has sure served me well. It doesn't mean you'll decide to do it, 
or you're just open-minded, you know, in that culture of excellence, that there might be a better way. There just might be. And it might come from sources that you're not used to. You know, it might come from a player. It might come from an assistant. It might come, you know, in all kinds of different ways, but you're open to it. And then you give it its proper due uh, in regard to it. Second thing is, is practice and game planning uh, when you win the day. Now, I'm going to turn on just some clips that, that happened to come my way this week of my team. This is, this is back in 218 um, in, in, in our playoff situation. And I'm going to put it up there. Hopefully, maybe you can see a little bit of how we play offensively, you know, in regard to it. Uh, we spread the floor. We do a lot. The ball moves. You know, this particular year, I think we led the league in three-point shooting. We led the league in assists. Uh, the ball moves, doesn't stick a lot in regard to it. We, we play fast. We hope to play as many possessions as we can. Uh, we're a good passing team. You know, those kinds of things. That's kind of what we're trying. And, and, and I watched this, and I thought, well, that's a pretty good example of kind of how we try to play the game in Seattle and, and kind of what I believe. And I, I think when you practice plan for a system like that, you need to hold and then part, okay? You need a picture, for example, of, of, of what you want to do. And that carries over into practice planning. I, I, I think if you want to win the day, you've got to have an idea how you're going to do your whole season. How am I going to practice? When am I going to practice? Okay. Um, those kinds of things. You know, I have to do it because in my situation before the, obviously the isolation, you know, we traveled a lot. You know, what day do we take off? How do we handle practice in these situations? But it's one of the most important things I do. And I got a feeling it's most important to you. You know, take the time to look at, a, at an overview of it. Because sometimes your thinking is really good in those moments. And then when you get in the moment, you sometimes are not impulsive. You have thought it through. And I think it's important that you get a season overview that starts with, with looking at how we're going to practice, how we're going to rest. Um, when travel's involved in those type of things. And you do that beforehand. So that's sitting ready for you as you get to the day-to-day -day and you go about winning those day-to-day. -day. Now, the practice plan. I, I will give you the second point that, that I absolutely live by. Never waste time. Never waste time. I don't want the players to waste mine or the coaching staffs, and I don't want to waste theirs. I think it's very, very important that we have that kind of dual goal with each other. And if they're wasting my time in practice, then all of a sudden you see a different kind of coach use. But if I at any time waste their time, that will, that will haunt me. I won't sleep that night. I want everything to be about not wasting time. So from a practice planning standpoint, I will tell you it, I kind of go to the minute, you know, and I'm going to give you my way of doing it, but I think you need to have a routine of how you establish practice. Like for example, um, I will end the practice. Um, I will take care of, you know, the post-practice things and, and all those different things. I often have media, but I'll probably end up in a discussion with my assistant coaches, just a dialogue about a couple things and I'll seek some information, okay? I might talk to a player, but I'll end up back in my office, or uh, if I gotta go somewhere, I'll end up in a quiet moment, and I will put down a, a basic outline for the next practice. I will put it down. And I will then send it out to all the people that are involved in it, uh, coaching wise, if I've got a leader on the team, I might even send it to a player. And I just might say, add any ideas you want. And, and I've done that for a long time. And that's usually done in the late afternoon, early evening, 
uh, and, and there'll be some dialogue back and forth occasionally. And then I'll wake up the next morning and I will look at that practice plan and I will see if it made sense to me. I will see if I've had any additional thoughts. And then usually between seven and eight, when I'm up on the elliptical to get my workout, I will put a final practice plan and then I send it out to everybody in regard to that. And that's my routine. But you need one. You need one. And, and, and the practice plan itself to me, um, I think it, it, it is so important that you kind of, um, I can't say I stay on time all the time, but I try to, to give value to the different things I'm trying to do. I, I, I really goes back to not wasting time. If I didn't follow the plan well, I'm usually researching myself as to how can I do that better? You know, how can I plan better? I kind of want to do that, you know, in, in regard to what I'm doing. Um, and, and I'll give you the, this is the third point. This is what I do in developing. I, I do it also in game and I'll talk about games here in a second, but I reflect, I plan, I evaluate, and then I plan again. I reflect, I plan, I evaluate, and I plan again. And let's jump over to games now, because I think that's important, you know, how, how we prep for games, you know, as coaches, for example. Now, I, I tend to watch three games of my opponent, and I have the ability to, 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 to do that. I know we all don't have to do that. But if I can, and I certainly would include former games. I, I play people four times in my league in a normal season. Uh, but but I, 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 I will make sure I have watched three. And if we play, that's, that's certainly one of them, you know, in regard to it. Uh, second thing I will do within the game prep is I study the stats. The stats absolutely drive probably more than my evaluation of film. Stats drive me. I look at certain things. Who's shooting the three? Who passes the ball well? Who turns it over? Um, minute distribution, different things. If you said, coach, you can only have one thing to prepare for an opponent, it would be stats. It would be stats. I would tell you that right now. Um, then I kind of take it to an evaluation phase, which might be my staff. And I let them kind of weigh in. So I've gone through the film, I've gone through the stats. Now I'm in an evaluation phase where I listen to others who are doing some of the same things or bring a perspective, you know. And then at that point, you know, now I'm ready to win that day to day as far as whether it's a practice before a game the next day or a shoot around, all those things I'm now in a, in. I feel like I have planned well, but I will tell you the last thing that I, I find very helpful <clears throat> as I get in the game and I do all this work and people call it hay in the barn, all those kind of things. When I get in the game, I'm open-minded. I just I am in love with the game of basketball, but it's unique. And, and it's not a, a sport that we just plan out to the nth degree. It doesn't always follow a logical, kind of progression that, that we always follow. So I'm very open-minded as I get in the game. And there are times I think we as coaches have to make some decisions. We're prepared and we got the confidence, you know, that, that we have done something when probably nobody knows we were doing it. Players don't often know. You've got that confidence in here, but you're open-minded to the moment. And, and that is the process. I would also tell you that I think game review is important. Uh, even though you played the game, you know, you deal with the win and the loss and all those things, but how do you use dialogue with your team after a game? And I'm not talking about so much, like when I dialogue after the game immediately, a lot of times I'm talking in a way to give them a way to possibly uh, 
think about what just happened, talk to the media, whatever. You know, you hope that maybe you're resonating in a way that they, they might use some of what you talk about in a positive way uh, for themselves and, and the situation they're about to be in. But I'm talking about the next day. We have four factors, and you can look it up, the four factors of, of our statistical analysis. I, I use the four factors to statistically talk to the team. And I, and I do do offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency. And you can certainly find how to do that within your game too. And initially, I tried to educate the team on what those numbers mean. And I got very frustrated because um, I, I, don't, I think they were more interested in, is this good? Is this bad? Is this average? You know, is this – in keeping with what we do is with this real below what we do. How does it compare in the league? So I talk more in that way. You know, this was good. You know, this was bad. This, this is below our average. And, you know, just that kind of way that they know why we're concentrating and bringing it up in practice or why we're addressing it, you know, some way as a team, you know, in regard to it. Now, the last thing I want to talk about when in the day to day, is coaching communication. Um, and, and I will tell you that one of the things as I've evolved as a coach is that I think in terms of a lot of empowering the team, um, my role as a coach is to empower the team. It's not so much to empower me. And to do that effectively, I think you have to do a great job of coaching coaches. And I think that we don't spend probably enough time doing that. You know, we don't get our assistance in sweet spots. We don't coach that coach before the moment. Because if you allow your, your, your assistants to really coach, and you do a good job of dialoguing with them or getting them in the right spots, all of a sudden, your culture, your thinking, your instruction, all those things are enhanced. Your, your reach just widened immensely. And I think you need to do the same thing with staff. If you've got an operations person, if you've got a manager, if you've got a uh, PR person, what, whatever you're doing, I, I, I think you've got to use the art of teaching and coaching in relation to those people. And I will tell you this, what I have found is your more observant players will be aware of how you do that. And they will imitate that within the team. The more observant ones will also start to understand the art of teaching you know, in regard to it. And that's the next one. The art of teaching. How, how do people learn? You know, how do your players learn? How does your staff learn? You know, um, that's vital. That's vital. Is it repetition? Is it verbal? Is it, you know, visual where you're watching tape and doing it? There's all kinds. Of, we try to hit a lot of ways, but I kind of want to know where the sweet spot is for every player. And I want that to be common knowledge to the leaders of my team. So when they try to reach their teammates, okay, they also understand that, you know, and a lot of times I'll talk to players and, and I want them to, you know, how do you learn best? How, how do you get, you know, because it's really not what you know as a coach, it's what you can teach. And we all know that, you know, I, I mean, there's some brilliant, brilliant coaches from the standpoint of knowledge and doing like that. But if you aren't a teacher, you know, you're, you're, you're getting 30% of that. You know, some people are like me, you know, I may not be brilliant, but I get almost 90% of what I got to them. Okay. And so I think the art of teaching is, is so important. And I think you literally have to plan for that in your practice. I think you have to create situations where your players have to communicate, especially in this day and age, they got to communicate with each other. They got to have the ability to talk. You step away as a coach. And I'll tell my assistants to step away. 
and you kind of lay down what we're trying to do. Maybe, maybe we're just scripting plays by scripting. I mean, running plays and all that. And you watch how that is developed and communicated among players. And hopefully you're working at, at other moments possibly, or maybe then, but at, you're, you're, you're working on the art of teaching in that communication between player to player. They kind of learn, you know, that in our philosophy, we talk about what we want to do three times to every time we talk about what somebody did wrong. You know, um, it's not that we accept doing it wrong. It's just we talk about what we should have done, what we want to do. Now, there'll be one time when you just got to say, hey, just don't force it, you know. But three times we're talking about read the defense, you know. What's the angle? Use a bounce. You know, we're talking about what we could do in, in that cute coaching communication. I will tell you this. Repetition to me is vital. And I know sometimes people and players are like, I'm tired of hearing that. But I'll tell you what, it's been proven that it sticks. And so repetition sometimes in what, in what we say or teach, repetition, in, there is a certain rhythm that we get to in practice where I start with certain things. There's, there's certain drills that are part of what we do every day because I find it that vital. And I am a big believer in repetition and persistence. And I don't care how good you are, and I don't care how boring it is. I find that as part of coaching communication. And, and then you see it in the players where they almost get comfortable. You, you know you've reached a pretty good cultural moment when you're, you're doing something maybe in your shoot around and you change the order and they're saying, coach, don't we go to here? And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. And, I know they think I'm stupid, but sometimes I do that on purpose because I kind of want them that way. I kind of want them thinking in, in that kind of persistent, repetitive way. Um, ending on a positive note is an important thing, I think, as we talk about coaching communication. You know, you can get on somebody. You can have actions that are difficult. But if you try to end that moment, on a positive note, maybe by the attention you give them, maybe by reaching out, maybe by where you place them in practice, you're gonna get probably a reward if, if we coach people hard, make the decisions we gotta make as coach that end on a positive note. I, I think that, that from an empowering standpoint and from a communication standpoint is gonna be awfully good. Um, the last point I will make, and it's one that, that I have really learned to live by, and, and it, you know, we as coaches, you know, you talk about leadership, and you talk about being a leader, and I, obviously that's important, but our leadership is greatest on display when we develop leaders, when we develop leaders. And we have to have a thought in that. And to do that, you have to give some of the ownership over to your leadership within your team. And we're all fortunate when we have those. I, I, I have had those, and it's probably why I have a long coaching career. But at some point, our job is helping develop them into being leaders and allowing, and in some cases, living with the fact that I think players carry the most uh, important part in leadership and, and, and player to player communication is the strongest form of communication. It's way more stronger than, than me to a player. It, player to player can, can bring out some heights in their teammates that, that I've just not seen that as, as good a motivator as, as we coaches want to be. Uh, I, I think that, that if we can do a good job of developing leaders and letting that kind of structure within our teams, that to me is the most powerful. But that's just some things I wanted to talk about what I think coaching can do to win the day-to-days. And I think if you win enough day-to-days, you know, all of a sudden your, your team is in a position for that championship run that you want. 
Wow, thank you so much, Coach. We do have some questions. Uh, the first one is, how should we handle a situation where the best player or best players on the team um, have a toxic attitude that, you know, spreads or gives a bad vibe? See, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting to me. I have a lot of uh, friends, mentors, former players, former friends that um, will, will talk to me in the off season. And in this past season, I probably had that particular situation more than I ever had before. Um, and I remember kind of reflecting with them. And, and here's what, and I'll give you the same talk I said to them. You got to remove the noise from your relationship with that player. Your mission is to coach that player well. And you have to, and, 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 and I, I'm respectful of parents, but a lot of times that's noise. And, and sometimes that noise can, can it reflect how we interact with that player, but we can't let that happen. We have to do a good job of treating that like, okay. And then putting all your thoughts, all your actions into coaching that player well and going through the dialogues with the player, not the parent, not the parent. Now, I know there's a part of us that kind of want to, you know, deal with this sometimes in a harsh way, maybe sometimes in an enabling way. I, I, I have never found that effective. What I have found effective is your relationship with the player. And, and zoning in on that and letting and telling the coach or telling the parent, you know what, I'm going to coach that your, your son or daughter so hard and so well and going to do this that you, I want you to see the love I have for her or, or him being a good player. And I'm going to take all my energy and dialogue to them. Okay. And I, I, I will tell you two good stories. I, I had that several times last year, but two of the stories uh, that had that moment turned around and they had fantastic ends to their season. You know, it's embracing the grind a little bit. I, I had two that just, you know, I raised a glass of wine with my wife to them because they fought through it, got to a better place and their team att attained championships or success at the end of the season. You know, and so that's part of our deal as coaches. And when you are, when you're, you and your staff are getting ready to draft a player, what are some of the intangibles, non-negotiables that you look for when deciding who am I going to draft? Well, I would be wrong. The first thing, you know, I've, I've got to look and, and, and whatever, I'm at the WNBA level. What do they do at a WNBA level that I can use as a coach? You know, is it, can they shoot it at that level? Can they, uh, are they athletic to a high level? Are they able to make decisions and different things? That there's got to be a WNBA talent or skill. And I think wherever you are, you got to look and say, okay, they can do this for us. But then the second thing, to me, and, and it, it is a non-negotiable thing. They just can't take my energy or the energy of a leader too much. They've got to be a good teammate. They, they, they just have to. And they, I, I, if I don't think they're a person that can embrace the grind, that can maybe get through a moment that's not real good, either because of a decision I had to make or the team's got to – going to have a rush patch in the season. I have a hard time saying yes to it, whether I'm making a decision or whether I'm advising other people and people that have been around me know that. And assistant coaches will say, well, coach, we get them around our players. She'll be fine. She'll be all this. You know what? Haven't found that to be true. Just haven't found it to be true. Not if they're genuinely not somebody that is a good teammate. Now you can have flaws and be a good teammate. You know, we're, we're not perfect. But if you're not going to be a good teammate, you know, um, I, that is a non-negotiable. And, and 
all of a sudden you go into a different pile in regard to decisions. And uh, that one has served me well. Someone else asked, how often do you review your routine to look for potential time wasters? And how do you evaluate whether something is worth the time that you might invest into it? That's a really good question. You know, probably not enough do I look and say, you know, am I wasting time here? Um, I have one of those minds that replays a lot of things in my, in my head. But that's probably something I've gotten from this discussion that's pretty good. You know, I, I might want to say, you know, uh, step back a little bit and say, are we getting what we wanted here? Because I think I could improve. And, it, and I think you want to look at that. I'm not afraid to look and say, you know what, maybe I can get better at this, you know, and I think uh, that's a good example. I think I can do a better job of looking and saying, is there a different way that I can accomplish maybe what's, you know, grounded in what we want to do? Can I do it and get it here? Can I do it? And I probably could improve myself. And I think I, I'll come out of this session, maybe thinking about that. Cause I, I think that's a great point raised. Um, Sometimes I get it because I, I uh, am a careful observer of players and their body language, you know, and, and, and if I feel like they're not challenged mentally, I kind of notice it. But I think I could even go deeper and, and look for different ways to maybe get what I'm trying to get across. Very good question. Someone else asked, how do you handle a player that's doing all the right things, coming to the gym early, staying late, working their tail off, but they just aren't seeming to improve at the rate at which you guys would like as far as, you know, the level that you're playing at? Well, I think that's a, a part of our, our life as coaches. I value those people and, 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 and I'm not afraid to share. Uh, sometimes my talks to the teams are not about the obvious – best player on the court. They might about be about someone who had a selfless kind of moment or somebody who's kind of been there for us. And I'm not afraid to walk up to them and tell them, you know, uh, in regard to, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was coaching in Cleveland, I happened to have my uh, Cleveland Rockers mug from 20 years ago uh, today. But I had a player, her, her name was Trisha Bader Benford. Okay, at the time, and an incredible teammate, as hard a worker as I've ever seen, talented, but didn't always get the playing time, you know. And I, I, I would come in. I, I was in Gund Arena, and sometimes I'd walk in the afternoon after practice, and I'd hear a ball bouncing down on this arena floor. And a lot of times it was Trisha, you know, in regard to it. Well, fast forward, you know, and and I wanted to make sure Trisha knew that when the moment happens she was going to be ready and we could all learn from that you know I had the same thing in a player named Sammy Whitcomb who you know I played her some I, I didn't as much and then we got into the playoffs and I needed her and she had done all the right things she had kept herself in condition she had done the extra work she had mentally embraced the grind when things didn't go her well and boy she delivered a game five and we went to the finals for a championship. But players like that, but I, you need to, you can't soften the fact that you may not play them, but you somehow got to make them feel how important they are to the process. And our philosophy is to coach every player with a vigor and that what they're doing is important to us. And sometimes you do it one-on-one -on -one, and sometimes you do it in front of the team. What are some tips that you might could provide on improving player to player communication and how do you coach a quiet point guard? Um, good questions. Um, I, I, I think sometimes uh, you get the players a little bit outside their comfort zone. Okay if you're talking about a quiet player, okay, you, you kind of uh, give them enough trust 
that they start to move outside their comfort zone a little bit and you encourage them to do that. And in some cases you demand that they do that. Um, in regard, and that's a, that's a tough one, you know, and in some cases they don't have to be, I, I never in coach two point guards the same. And, and I've been blessed. You know, the reason I'm still coaching is because I've probably coached the, the, the greatest arsenal of point guards in my career that any coach has. Part of the reason that I think some people think, well, he's a pretty good coach is because I've had pretty good point guards. And, but they've all been different. And I never tried to make – Don Staley was my first point guard in, when I took over as an interim coach. And I certainly didn't try to coach Don like I coached um, Susie McConnell's cereal the next day, the next year in, in Cleveland. And I didn't coach Susie like I coached uh, Don Staley, who was behind – or I, I mean uh, Helen Darling, who was behind her. And I didn't – Coach Helen, like I did Jennifer Rosati, who played with her, and then I Mariah Jefferson and Sue Bird and Becky Hammond and oh, so on and so on. I don't mean to leave any out, but I, I, I let them kind of be the best version of themselves they can be. But I will watch them interact and encourage them to have communication in their various ways, and, and some are more talkative than others, but then I will take a moment away from that moment and we will talk about it. We will talk about, you know, I, I think she receives it this way. What do you think? And I, and I just kind of get them to think about teaching, not just the facts and not just how they get it across, but I, I will spend time with them just like I do an assistant coach. And I'll talk and I don't always correct them right at that moment. I might, if it, if I'm just so, involved but in a lot of cases I'll I'll grab another moment and then I will also see when they were really affected and I will walk by and maybe even in practice and say hey that's a great job you know being there for her in that regard that's a great job so I those are all part of the uh, smaller stories within a practice that that I may deal with at another point now you obviously have some great players and great leaders on your team how do you think, let me ask it this way, how much of a role do you think that leadership played in eventually winning your 2018 championship? Oh, it's huge. Um, I came in uh, to that team and I thought there were good players there. And I probably came to Seattle because of the players, because of not only the, the, how good they were, but also the people that they were, the leaders that they were. But they, you know, they were 15 and 19 the year before. They hadn't really been, you know, a winning basketball team for several years at that point. Uh, but what happened was, as I came in there, I, I got a chance to watch Sue Bird, Brianna Stewart, Jewel Lloyd up front and day to day, like we're talking. And it wasn't anything Dan Hughes did. All I did was empower them to take a position within the team. And then maybe along the way, um, if I needed to, to help in some way, I would. But the driving force wasn't Dan Hughes. The driving force were players like I just mentioned. You know, understanding how Alicia Clark was so pivotal to that team. Adding Natasha Howard to it. Having Crystal Langhorn change roles and embrace it. And, and make a positive in that drafting Jordan Canada to, to, to develop as a backup with Sue and being totally different than Sue. You know, it, it was about people that in their own lanes were all driving in the same direction. Now you mentioned some drills that you do every single day for consistency during your practices. Um, Someone wants to just know a little bit more detail on what they were and how you carry them out. Well, just looking at practice here. Um, obviously, we all start with the warm-up period and all those kinds of things uh, out of it. But I come out of that every day and I shoot. The first thing I do is shoot. Is shoot. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. The first thing I do is, is a communication drill. I do a four-corner passing where I make them talk to each other. That is every day. And it's not about the passing drill. It's about communication. I, I, I want to build their verbal 
interaction with each other. I just find that's really necessary, necessary. It, it, as well as warming the muscles up. We got to warm up the fact they're talking effectively to each other. So that is always the first thing I do. The second thing I do is then shoot the basketball. I, I, I want to put a ball in their hands. I, even though they've done pre-practice and that's all part of our regime and, and, and their routine, we're going to shoot the ball. And they're usually catch and shoot type of situations. And we're all going to do that. We're going to have a minute each that they're doing that from different spots. And they're putting the basket and putting the ball in the basket in there. The third thing, and we do it every day, is we're probably going to run the floor. We're going to run the floor from one end to another. We're going to start to script our early offense. Um, and we're going to do it in a way that starts the communication that, that we already began in the four corner. We're going to go through the different things and going up and down the floor. And that will include transition defense. You know, a lot of times we'll do it and I'll say, okay, we got to, we got to get back. You know, we're, we're going to run this down and we're going to get back in transition defense. And we build the philosophy of our transition defense out of that. And the last thing that, that, that that's very common in our warm up period on the court, not, not the stretching is we will script in the half court. And normally, you know, maybe early in the season I'm involved, but a lot of times I'm not involved in that. I, I, I mean, having Sue Bird as your point guard, she's probably got a, and I've seen her with a list of things. She's going to, she's going to help kind of communicate during that, that thing. And I love that. And I, I, I want them to talk and work it out with each other. And it goes right. Those are things we do every day. Now, from a drill standpoint, I will tell you defensively the one thing and people that have been around me know I close out every day, every day. The single thing that we probably do every day that I don't know if ever, we close out, we close out every day. Sometimes we'll do it in a technique way. Sometimes we do it in a live way. Sometimes we do it both, but we close out every day. We, we run our practice, which have different emphasis, but we always end up making a free throw at the end of the practice to end. And I bring them together. There's always a made free throw of some type. Uh, there might be a challenge and they meet it. I love that and do that a lot. Uh, but we always end on a made free throw. Those are constants that, um, and, and I, I, I remember when we were in the championship and we were now, we had uh, we had to wait a little, little bit to play the first game of the playoffs. And they asked the players, well, how's it different? And they're like, well, it's not different. You know, we're kind of doing the same things. Well, that, to me, that made me feel good because we want to be doing the things every day. It's just part of that repetition and things that I, I do believe in, in in regard to it. But that's, that's a great question. That, those things we probably do every day. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry about that. I didn't want Bingo. to click. Got you now. Okay. So what has the experience been like as a member of the coaching staff for the United States basketball um, and, and kind of what has it been like to transition? You know, you've coached in the United States, but also now coaching internationally. Um, a great honor, an absolute great honor. Uh, something that uh, um, I feel very blessed to be a part of and uh, want to do a good job with it. And especially it, it, if you kind of look at the situation, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of my career with men's and I loved it. I, I, I didn't, but, but I got into the women's game and it has treated me so well. And to realize after 20 years that I can be involved with a Olympic pursuit, you know, and, and a world cup that, that I was prior, uh, you just feel awfully blessed, you know, in regard to it and awfully thankful. But the other thing that, that is, is just so uh, empowering to me is that, you know, Don Staley is, is the Olympic coach. And Don, uh, when I was an interim coach in Charlotte, she was my point guard, you know, and I watched her attain an incredible position as a coach. You know, I mean, she was a Hall of Fame player, but she's a Hall of Fame coach. And being able to circle back after almost 20 years and be 
on her staff and interact with Don, oh, you just feel blessed, you know, because that's the things that we coaches, if as I get older, you know, the watching what our former coaches, what our players do with their lives is one of the absolute joys. And then to circle back and really know Don at this point as the head coach is, is just, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm a motivated assistant coach. Um, and I spent a lot of time as an assistant coach, you know, in regard to it. But the staff itself, I, I, I have ties to and being able to learn internationally is another way I think I've gotten better as a coach, you know, at, in my 60s. Uh, and we're all, if we're doing it right, we're trying to find a way to get better. Absolutely. Yeah, Dawn is such a great, she's great. Just all around from a player all the way up to a coach. Um, thank you so, so much, Coach, for being with us today, for sharing with us. Um, it's, it's been an honor to speak with you and um, learn more about developing excellence. If you guys um, have time, make sure you tune into our next session. Um, Coach, uh, just again, thanks so much. And um, I'll, drop every, I'll drop his email down here in the Q&A. So if you would like to reach out to Coach, that you can do so. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, and again, in this time and period, you know, the ability to continue to communicate uh, ha, ha, has so many positive effects to each of us. And one of the, the great things that I think has happened during this period is that I've been able to uh, interact with other coaches that make me better. And hopefully maybe what I share, it, it, it's a two-way street, but it's important we continue to find ways to communicate during these, these times. Absolutely, Coach. And if there's anything I can do or the basketball embassy can do, please just let us know. We'd love to continue to connect and, and help you out any way we can. All the best. Same to you. Have a great day. Okay.